Thank you all for coming in today. I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, Camp Aggie and uh, Texas A&M during the Great War. Um, really what it, Camp Aggie focuses in on, the Texas A&M on campus during World War I and the federal training camp essentially that was established there to train uh, soldiers in a number of areas during uh, the war. So in 1917, here's the campus. Um, it was, generally everything was going on normally on campus. There was about 1,242 students on campus. They were training in uh, agriculture and mechanical engineering aspects for the most part, and also, of course, being enrolled in the Corps of Cadets. So there was the military aspect going on. Lusitania was sunk in 1916, May. In February 1917, the Zimmerman telegram came to light. And in March, the faculty members of Texas A&M uh, had a meeting. All of them came together. They voted unanimously to pass a resolution that said, we're going to offer the campus and all the faculty to the federal government for whatever use they want during the, uh, once we get into the war, if the war ever breaks out. Two days later, President Bazell took that resolution to a board of directors meeting in Fort Worth. The board of directors unanimously passed that decision as well, uh, that resolution, and uh, offered the, essentially in offering the, uh, the federal government the, uh, the whole campus and all the faculty. Also after that uh, re faculty resolution passed, uh, the students increased the war, uh, military training to uh, 10 hours per week, as well as they increased fire uh, uh, training, uh, doing uh, target practice to also to 10 hours a week. And the faculty members, some of them began actually taking military drill with the Corps cadets and things like that. They had their own little unit of faculty that would go out and do drill training and things like that to start uh, preparing for the war. So with that, in May, the cadets had essentially been given any no more requirements to attend classes on campus. They were allowed to go off and essentially start enrolling in the military in the preparation of the war after the uh, Congress had declared war in April. By May, the students were, many students were starting to drop out and join military units. So the faculty and administration said, you guys don't have to fulfill any more of your obligations at the college. Uh, 13 members of the senior class joined the Marine Corps. 73 went down to Camp Funston, which was in Leon Springs, just outside of uh, San Antonio. Um, there was about 133 students in the senior class. Um, I've heard a number of times people report that the whole class went in mass in the military. There's, that's not completely true. There's, I'd say 80% of the senior class went in there. There was a number of guys who also went off and uh, went into normal job careers right after the war, or right after uh, the entrance of the United States in the war after they're graduating. But um, at Camp Funston on June 3rd, the faculty and staff moved, went down to uh, the camp uh, and they had a graduation ceremony essentially for all the seniors who were enrolled down at Camp Funston uh, in the first officer training corps there. The gentlemen were given uh, certificates of completion. They weren't actually given diplomas because they didn't finish all of their schooling. And they, they, that was their way around it, the saying they had essentially completed their, their schooling and were given these certificates instead of uh, giving actually diplomas down at uh, Camp Funston. In September, word came from the federal government that A&M had been selected as a post for Signal Training Corps to send troops in for uh, specialized training. During this time, there were six colleges that were picked um, for the specialized training, and A&M was one of them as selected here. And um, in December of 1917, the uh, Depot Detachment K of the Signal Corps arrived with 103 men on campus under this gentleman, M.C. Funston. He uh, it was related to what the Camp Funston was uh, named in Leon Springs, but that was a little bit a weirdness misnomer because there was also a Camp Funston, a much larger camp in Fort Leavenworth uh, up in Kansas outside of Fort Leavenworth that was also going on um, named Camp Funston. Um, so Camp Funst, uh, this was, he was a lieutenant when he first arrived. By the time uh, the war had ceased, he had raised a captain on campus. Um, he was in charge of all the Signal Corps gentlemen who came on campus, which was all of the guys who were actually under the Signal Corps were their training. Um, they received their training under uh, F.C. Bolton uh, of the Electrical Engineering Department, and they were uh, barracked in Camp uh, Goodwin Hall on campus, is where the original men were stationed at on campus when they arrived. The first group here is, uh, was of the radio operators that arrived, and um, you can see them out here actually out in the drill field with YMCA in the background. But the gentlemen were learning how to do basic elementary uh, electrical engineering, um, how to set up uh, telegraphy, 
telephony, um, battery, working with batteries, setting up um, signal uh, tripods and wires and lines, but also they learned how to do general basic uh, flag um, signal core aspects as well on campus. Uh, the second group that came in was radio mechanics. So these gentlemen did the basics electrical engineering that many of the um, other guys had received as well as radio operators, but the other aspect they also learned how to do was um, build planes and also equip those planes with uh, electric uh, radio signaling equipment. Um, this image here is actually inside the pavilion where the, the, these works were actually done. So the planes were built inside the pavilion and um, you actually can see some, another aspect for another line that's gonna happen here. In the, I'm gonna talk about a little bit as well as there's a number of uh, vehicle chassis sitting up on top. Um, and I'll get into talking about a little bit about that as well. Actually, so those are frames, those are not the chassis sitting up there in the, uh, in the high aspects of it. You can see them like up here. With the increase of m equipment that was needed on campus, they needed more apparatus and signal core radios and equipment. So Ellington Field flew up material from, from, uh, from there in Houston to bring up extra equipment. Two planes were flown in on the campus in April of 1917. Uh, uh, the planes landed on the drill field and unloaded their equipment. The first plane tried to attempt, taking, attempt into taking off. It clipped the, uh, the um, trees at the edge of the drill field and the plane crashed. And this is the remnants of that plane. The, the two gentlemen on that plane survived. They were, they were not injured. The only thing they were able to salvage out of the plane was uh, the engine. So they shipped the, the, the rest of the, the, the frame of the plane and the engine back on a train back to Houston. Um, this caused the second plane not to take off the, that day. The next day, the, plane, the second plane was able to take off. It cleared the uh, trees at the drill field, got about a mile and a half southwest of campus, had engine trouble, and that plane crashed. So they didn't really work out with their quick equip attempt to get stuff back and forth up in that regard. Um, those two gentlemen also survived the crash, and they shipped that plane back, to, um, back down to Camp uh, Ellington, as well, Ellington Field as well. So. Um, this was, of course, this is some of this aspect that why uh, they had turned to the training camps was that the colleges were, had um, the faculty and the uh, apparatus in place and the trained individuals in place to try and teach um, this new technology that was starting to be infused into the military at this time. It was a transition from uh, horse-drawn carriages and the flag signal corps aspect into new technology of automobiles, tanks, and airplanes and uh, using electrical equipment to send uh, signals and information much more quickly. And so the, the federal government turned to colleges around the United States to bring in uh, this training aspect. Um, the next troop that came in was the service training detachment. So this kind of relates to those, uh, the, the, the bodies of the cars that were on campus. So gentlemen were brought in, they were trained in how to repair engines, fix radiators, uh, do a rate, chassis uh, repair, build, basically rebuild the whole vehicle, and also did uh, tire patching and things like that. Um, this was actually, this, this engine work here was done in one of the buildings that were built on campus. They had maximized all the space on campus, and so they had to build physically onto the campus, um, basically barracks and other uh, large rooms so that they could do the training because they did not have enough room on campus. It also actually resulted in, at one point, them actually building on a side part of Sabisa because they needed more room to feed all of the soldiers and the students who were on campus at that time on campus. Um, these gentlemen were trained under uh, the mechanical engineers essentially on campus for their work in uh, all the stuff dealing with uh, um, vehicle and chassis work. Another group that came on campus were machinists and blacksmiths and uh, they were obviously trained on uh, doing machine work and forming and pouring any number of uh, iron and molten steel objects on campus. This is a smaller group as well. This is probably uh, one of the smaller groups that trained on campus. Um, and uh, they were under, I believe, the, also under uh, mechanical engineering as well. I don't actually, sorry. Uh, yes, mechanical engineering. And the smallest group at all that, was, that came on campus was actually was farriers and horseshoers. These gentlemen were trained underneath uh, the vet school. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, there was horse-drawn and mule-drawn carriages. Still, they were still very much reliant on that in the military at this time. So they needed to have gentlemen who would be able to handle those, those, those aspects of re shoeing horses. And then they had farriers who had a little bit of vet 
veterinary knowledge of handling the hooves and feet of, uh, of the horses on uh, in the Army as well. So these gentlemen were trained, as I mentioned, underneath the veterinary medicine um, on campus. There's about 30 of these guys on campus. This is the smallest chunk of them. Um, the last major group that came on campus to train was the School of Meteorology. So this was done underneath this man, Oliver Fossig. This started in May of 1918. The unique thing about School of Meteorology was it was the only one that was trained in the United States and of allied nations was only at Texas A&M. So nowhere else was there any of this training going on, on camp around the world in, for allied nations. Um, really what they were trying to do was have better understanding of artillery fire, airplane workings, smoke and gas attacks, um, and any number of other aspects of the weather being involved with military operations. The gentlemen were trained in how to inflate and use weather balloons and how to uh, gauge atmospheric pressure and things like that. They set up weather vanes and uh, rain gauges to collect uh, data for in that regard as well. As you can see, this is out in front of the academic building where this was set up at. They were mostly trained in all these gentlemen who were part of the military training did about two months on campus and then were sent off either to another military camp or directly over to Europe as part of uh, units going over to fight in Europe. About 4,000 guys um, were in the Federal Army who had served on, uh, came to A&M to receive specialized training during this time period. Um, at the same time, as all these guys were on campus, the ROTC had been in place basically from 19, officially from 1917 forward, but ostensibly ROTC training in that aspect had been going back since the college was formed in 1876 with it being a land-grant college. After the United States entrance into the war, college enrollment started dropping off and the federal government wanted specialized guys and guys who had good training before going into camps, having a better understanding of what they were getting themselves into and being able to possibly be officers. So the Committee on Education and Specialized Training, which was formed, instituted the Student Army Training Corps, which essentially started to replace the early aspects of the ROTC. The Student Army Training Corps was set up and went into effect in October 1917 on, or 1918 on camp, sorry, sorry, October 1918 on campus. Getting my days mixed, years mixed up there. And essentially what happened was the gentlemen all voluntarily entered into the SATC. They were given the rank of privates, and, which in, in, uh, and gave them the opportunity to receive pay. It kind of blocked off the aspect of them not being um, drafted. But with the fact that they were getting specialized training, they had a more likely aspect of being able to go directly into uh, a specialized officer training attachment if they were given a high enough grades at the SATC. Because of this, um, actually A&M's enrollment was on the incline during 1918-19 uh, school year. There, there were up to um, about 1,500 students were enrolled during A&M's school year during the 18. 1918, 1919 school year. So there was a slight dip right before that, then uh, the turning on of the SATC. But the idea that A&M's campus actually had completely went dry was, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. People thought it did, but actually there was only about a 90 student drop between 19, entrance in 1917 and 1918. Uh, the 17, 18 school year, there was a slight drop, about 90 students was all. And then by 19, um, 1918, the student enrollment actually had gone back up because of the SATC on campus. Um, with that, uh, both the students on campus and the federal training soldiers received uh, a number of uh, trainings that they were was going in duplication. So the guys received bayonet training, military bayonet training here. Uh, this is actually out in the drill field as well. They also, with the increase in trench warfare in Europe, had taken hold. And so as a result, uh, the soldiers were and students were taught in how to do entrenching work on, on campus. I don't know exactly where this is on campus. I've not been able to figure that out because of the angle of this shot doesn't show any buildings in the background, any dis discernible details in it. I'm still trying to figure out where exactly this happened. But this was after about 20 or 30 minutes of training, these guys were given a break and they had done some entrenching here on campus. Another thing that was brought in to do um, was boxing. The idea that boxing, one, was, one aspect was for physical fitness training and things like that, but the other idea was that uh, for hand-to-hand -hand combat, I think there was one of those things that they, they thought hand-to-hand -hand combat was going to happen with boxing, but it really wasn't a thing that people would square up in the trenches and start boxing each other. Didn't happen, so 
um, it was it was it was I guess good idea and thought, but like in actual practicality, it, it never would have never happened. In that you know it was much more brutal hand to hand combat going on on camp uh, and in the trenches and during the war. I think one aspect of I'd like to point out I don't know if any of you guys noticed in some of these photos was uh, this gentleman right here uh, in the pith cap. That is uh, Captain uh, Martin. He was a Canadian. He was brought in by President Bazell from the 79th Cameron Highlanders from, Can uh, from uh, a Canadian unit. He had trained, went over and fought in Europe, became injured, but was uh, sent back to, uh, for rehabilitation uh, from his wounds to Canada. And there was agreements going on between the federal government and the United States and the Allied Nations to bring in guys who had served overseas in the battles to, to bring their experiences to train the Americans in what was happening actually over there. So, Captain Martin was brought in and was leading a lot of day-to-day uh, -day military training also as a kind of a, uh, as an attached attache from uh, the Allied Nations to provide his personal experience and knowledge to train the guys so they're better prepared when they went over and fought in, uh, in, in uh, Europe. And another aspect that the soldiers received and the students received was target practice. Again, I don't know exactly where they're doing the target practice on camp campus. I'm still trying to figure that one out. They received target practice training in pistols, rifles, and machine guns on campus. So they were receiving a, a, a large amount of uh, different um, uh, weapon training on campus when, when this is going on. Um, so one of the aspects that hit campus and the United States, just like it hit all of Europe, was the Spanish influenza in 1918. Uh, the origins really are, are murky. There's no known and agreed upon origins of the Spanish influenza hit in, uh, in Asia, hit in Europe, and hit in the United States. In the United States, and, in, and specifically Bryan College Station, it hit the campus about uh, September of 1918 when reports start, first started coming out. Um, as this started happening, uh, President Bazell put the campus under um, a quarantine, had actually guards uh, placed around campus so people couldn't come in and leave campus. and. Um, but that, of course, didn't prevent the spread of influenza up into the Bryan uh, community as well. Um, between September of 1918 and the end, the end of September and the end of October, for a little, but right about a month, a little over a month, um, my numbers as of right now are about 45 students, uh, faculty, staff, and a couple of their wives died uh, of the influenza. I'm still, this is very early uh, research I've been able to produce on that, so I need to go a little bit more in depth to figure out what, uh, how many more actually possibly had died, but as of right now, I've got a list of about 45 names that of, of people who died during uh, this about a month period of the influenza outbreak on campus. Um, there was a outroar in, uh, in, in the community. There was anonymous letters written into the Eagle, and other people actually wrote uh, editorials claiming that there was very unsafe practices by uh, the captain of the, um, Captain Morgan was his name, was in charge of the, uh, of the hospital. He was a surgeon who the, the military had sent to, um, to campus from the medical corps, that he was not properly handling the situation, that uh, he was rejecting any offers from campus or from the community around. He was not uh, ha properly handling people. People were sick and making calls and he, they weren't being answered. One infamous barrack was barrack number five, so they had to build, they had a number of the, uh, the dormitories were, had been designated for the federal soldiers on campus, but because of the number of uh, guys who were on campus, they actually built a number of wood barracks on campus as well. Barracks number five has been reported to have been a cesspool of disease and death, and I haven't seen an official report, I'm still trying to dig in the National Archive to find out for sure what the official line was on what was happening there. Uh, Captain Morgan wrote a response in the Eagle saying that all of the uh, reporting was inaccurate and had not been, he had not been consulted to properly talk about what is actually going on. So the, a, a paper, newspaper was going, report was thrown out there and he said this is all erroneous and um, I was not negligible in my duties. And so there's a tension between him and the local community as well what was happening on campus. Um, like I said, I need to do a lot more digging to find out all, all the, try and find out some more facts and how, if there was more, more guys there who had died. Um, we're debating right now as well on trying to figure out for sure. Um, we're leaning toward yes is the soldiers, the SAT guys who were enrolled as Gold Star Aggies as well because they were officially privates in the U.S. Army. So we're leaning toward adding those guys to our Gold Star list. At this current date, we're up to 61 
gold stars who had lost their lives in either combat um, of airplane accidents, or we had a few guys who had died training as pilots, and also as, as instructors had died in uh, army combat, but also a number of guys that were in federal training camps or overseas that had died of influenza. Um, we're leaning toward adding about a five, probably five more names onto our Gold Star Aggie list because of the fact that they were officially privates in the military and they were training at uh, Camp Aggie um, as part of this training aspect. Um, so November 11th, 1918, armistice happened. On campus, students were and fa uh, students, faculty, and the soldiers were awakened by the campus Wilson was being blown in the early hours. Um, and students and soldiers gathered and started partying on campus. This gentleman here decided to climb up the, the flagpole on campus. So this is actually, this is out on campus here. So he climbed up to the top of the flagpole. Um, but some of this was short-lived. The, actually the uh, president and the federal, all the, all the military officers said, we don't know if the um, armistice is gonna hold. So as a result, we're continuing our training of um, our, our military training because armistice was reached and uh, the guys went back to actually taking their normal class loads and um, military training on campus. Um, in February of 1919, word came that A&M was actually going to become a, uh, a spot for vocational education. The uh, Federal Board of Vocational Education was set up to, uh, had set up around the United States colleges and universities to train soldiers who had gone over and fought, fought. Originally, the idea was to train guys who were referred to as disabled soldiers, so guys who had uh, received en uh, uh, injuries and things like that to try and provide them with some kind of training so that they could have some kind of skill to go out in life and be, be productive citizens uh, in the world. Eventually, the, the program was opened up to any veteran, really, who had served uh, was allowed to come in on campus and retrieve uh, specialized training. Initially, they were put into a two-year program if they were showed enough promise, they were encouraged to go actually into and become full-time, four-year stu four students to get a full college education. Um, about 2,000 guys went through the program from 1919 to 1925 on A&M's campus. Uh, one of the other aspects of that is these gentlemen were not required to serve in the Corps. You can see a, a few of these guys in these images do have uh, their Corps uniforms on, so they could voluntarily join the Corps, but they were not required to actually enter into the Corps. So um, the guys were referred to as the casual company or, um, or federal students and things like that is what they referred to around campus during this time period. Um, with that, there was also the movement to honor those who had served uh, the college at A&M. This is actually um, at the dedication of the, the World War I obelisk, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later, the, was it, which has been referred to as the Westgate Memorial and things like that. Um, and on this, with this is, this is Governor Neff here. I if I hit the right button. And uh, you can kind of see it outlined over here. This is the World War I service flag, which is gigantic. I have a photograph at the very end of it, of the, the presentation of it, that is draped over uh, the World War I uh, monument. So the first aspect that was proposed was in uh, February 1919 by, which essentially was the Alumni Association at the time. Um, and that was to create a memorial stadium at Kyle Field. Funds were raised, a cornerstone was cut, but they never raised enough funds to actually create a memorial stadium at Kyle Field. And essentially, nothing ever became of it. The cornerstone is still in existence. Um, there's talk, my understanding right now, between AFS and athletics to try and actually bring that cornerstone out and put it over into um, the west side of Kyle Field to have it on display over there right now. Um, the other aspect I don't know for sure on this that I'm, my hypothesis is, is uh, this is kind of where the origin of maybe the, uh, I believe, possibly the uh, flags over Kyle Field started from. I don't know for sure. Um, I've never seen any concrete evidence of that. That's just my hypothesis that because the Memorial Stadium never amounted to anything, that they wanted to do something to memorial memorialize the, stu the soldiers, former students over Kyle Field, and they went with the flags instead of as a result of that. But I don't know for sure 100% on that one. I'm still trying to dig through that aspect as well. So the next thing that was brought forward was the memorial trees on campus. So in February of 1920, 52 trees were planted around the drill field to honor all of the Aggies who died in World War I. By the end of the month, that number had changed to 53. And um, I don't know quite how that happened. Originally, in newspaper articles, it was printed that it was flat out said 52 names. 
the Alumni Quarterly, which was an alumni former student publication at that time, was put out in February of 1920, but it claimed that there was 53 students who had received uh, trees around that. So sometime between early fe February and late February, a 53rd name was added at that time to the trees. Um, markers for them did not come in to believe at the earliest was in 1930 was the first time they were added. Um, but I haven't found any concrete evidence. One of the former archivists is the one who claimed that that's when it happened, but I've not seen any evidence that says physically that it actually, that's when it happens. Um, and the next grouping of markers, which you can actually see here, these aluminum bolt-on were put up in the 1971, which were put around the trees. And at this the same time, they actually reoriented some of the trees from uh, the original location actually to completely encompass the drill field. So originally when the trees were planted, they were not all originally around the drill field. They had actually come up a little bit behind um, Hart Hall, what is Hart Hall now, and Bazell Hall there, and down Houston Street as well. And then they had actually, for some reason, they removed those markers. Um, the service fraternity Alpha Phi Omega, for some reason, decided to move them to completely encompass the drill field at that time. Um, a, Third version of the marker was put up. I have no idea when that is. I've not been able to find a single reference on when that happens, when that happened. And because I, I, I know there's a third version and I know there's a fourth version because the fourth version went in in 2015. They replaced the fourth version that had been, the third version that had put out. I've got the first, second, third uh, issues of those plaques sitting in Cushing Library. I can't find any documentation as of right now on when the third version was put out there. Um, a lot of times what happened with them is the trees had, these markers had gone in disrepair, this, this stuff had gone missing, or they had been broken and stolen. And so over time, they had eventually replaced the plaques, replaced the plaques, replaced the plaques kind of thing. So um, the next item that was put out uh, to memorialize students was funded by the class of 23, 22, 23, 24, and, and 25, raised funds to create this marker here, the uh, World War I Memorial. Originally, when it was funded and put in place, it was next to Guyon Hall, which essentially now is where um, Rudder Tower is at. Um, it sat there for a number of years. When they raised Guyon and get ready to put in Rudder Tower, they moved it closer out in front of the MSC. Eventually, it moved to this location, which is on uh, an island out in the middle of Old Main. Then they moved it again to in front of um, the end of the drill field. and it, it's. Was at, for, it was sat there for a number of years and kind of got the misnomer it was the Westgate Memorial. Um, that was just a adopted name for it. The original name really was the War Memorial. Um, that memorial has been yet again moved and is now sitting um, in front of the core arches actually with all of their, with the Spanish American War Monument had been moved, moved over there. And then the other monument over there which mirrors them is the uh, monument to those since World War II monument out there in front of the core stack in the plaza. The last item that was uh, dedicated on campus to remembrance of the soldiers who died in World War I, the former students, was actually Memorial Gymnasium. This bit was established in 1924. Some of you might recognize, actually this is DeWare. Originally it was dedicated as Memorial Stadium, and in 1940, I think it was 1940, they for some reason dedicated, renamed the building to DeWare Gymnasium instead of Memorial Gymnasium and had removed that association with uh, the dedication to the guys who had lost their lives in World War I. And this is what, one last thing I was gonna show you. This is the um, service flag that I mentioned that very first image about the gold stars that was draped over uh, the War Memorial. This is in uh, the rotunda of the academic building. So this is a garrison style flag, it's absolutely massive. And it was a uh, canvas legend that was actually stitched in the basement of uh, um, the academic building at, this version here has um, stars on the outside. Normally, service flags have blue stars out here to represent those who served um, in the war. And in the center, they have gold, which you can't really see because it's so faded out in this image. Um, the A&M one actually has maroon stars. So this is actually these stars on the service flag is maroon. And in the center is gold. So there's about, there's estimate about 1,900 on the outside of this flag and 52 names, or 52 star, gold stars in the center of it. So it was a dated in time, so it had never been updated. Um, this sat in till the 1940s, I believe it was, and Wind had actually got a hold of it and ripped it and tore it down. And it got stored in a closet in the academic building till about 1970. A math professor found it in there took it to AFS, AFS put it on display for a while, and it's actually now in Cushing's collections. So the original service flag is in Cushing's collections. We can never really display it because of, it's absolutely massive, it's huge. It's like 10, 
feet by 25 feet or something like that. The thing is, you, we can't do anything with it to put it out on display. We do have funds raised now for it to actually do some restoration work because it's in, not in very good shape. It's single ply muslin wool, uh, cotton, so um, oh, sorry, muslin wool, and it's it's been it's, some areas have been moth eaten and uh, there's some fragility in it. So we're trying to get it some conservation work done and act on. Also, one of the gold stars is actually de detached from it, so we're trying to get, be able to put that back on the flag as well. So that's, that's my presentation. Y'all have any questions? I'll be free, uh, be happy to answer anything if you have anything. So 